Welcome to this broadcast of the Marvin United Methodist Church Sanctuary Service. I'm glad that God has called you to participate in this recorded message. Today is Father's Day, and we continue our sermon series, The Music of Our Faith, by looking more closely at the hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. Thank you, fathers and men who are like fathers to us, for the sacrifices made and the witness shown that has enriched our faith in Jesus Christ. Now let's join in as the message is already underway. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the other prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection, and even chains of, of imprisonment, jeers and flogging. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and mountains, living caves, living in caves and in the holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Again, so glad to have you here this morning. I know it's a damp morning, a lot of hard rain today, but glad that you are in church this morning. To those that are streaming live broadcast, we're glad that you are joining us as well and our TV audience as well. We're glad that you are here. Let's pray together. Lord, in these moments as we come before you, I pray that you might now speak through me May your Holy Spirit be active in this place, quickening our hearts and minds to be attentive to your voice. Lord, uh, strengthen us that we might have a great witness for those who come behind us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So happy Father's Day to the dads in the congregation. Many of you have uh, children with you today, so pleased to see that, and uh, we are honored by your presence here in worship. We are thankful for your witness to Christ and how it blesses us here in the church. We have prayed for you this morning. We will continue to pray for that witness, but we are glad that you have chosen to be in worship today. This week, I learned about the origins of Father's Day. I learned that uh, there was a a, a daughter of a Civil War veteran who... uh, Uh, decided after hearing a Mother's Day sermon in church that there should be a Father's Day. You see, her father uh, was uh, the father of six, and her mother had died in childbirth, so this father was raising six children on his own. And I love the fact that she was inspired by a sermon in church and that she was inspired by her father's witness, his stamina and strength. Can you imagine trying to raise six children on your own? I'm sure he had some kind of help of family and friends to support him, but the fact that she desired to honor her father that way. And it wasn't, this was in 1910, but it took 55 years for Lyndon Johnson, who was then president, to make this a day that is now on our calendars, to which we honor our fathers this uh, Sunday in June. So, so glad that you are here today. I love the fact, again, that that uh, Father's Day had its beginnings after uh, hearing a sermon and after uh, being in church, and that just stirs my heart. But I remind you of the fifth commandment. That is, of the Ten Commandments, it says, honor your father and your mother. So we know that God had the idea of the importance of honoring moms and dads even before we decided to make it a special day uh, here. So we're glad that you are here today. 
Today we continue our sermon series, The Music of Our Faith, and it would seem appropriate that we would sing Faith of Our Fathers, and uh, as we have just sung that in those words, I want to encourage you, we're going to reflect upon those words of, the, of that hymn, actually going to use the first stanza, the, those, the first verse of that hymn to be kind of my sermon uh, outline, if you will. If you're taking notes, you can keep hymn 710 open, you can see and track along with me, and also Hebrews 11 is going to be where we're gathering material from the faith witness of those of the Bible who've gone before us. And so I remind you again that uh, John Wesley would say of himself that he was a man of one book, but he also had a songbook, a hymn book that was a part of his saddlebag that would go into his faith congregations. And so he knew that the Word of God was his way in which he stayed close to the Lord, but he also knew the great hymns of the church uh, were important. So those two will be speaking and framing our conversation today. The first point of it is, is this stanza reads, faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeons, Fire and sword will be where we'll go from there. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear the glorious word. That'll be the third point. And then faith of our fathers is a holy faith. That's the fourth, and then we'll wrap it up with, we will be true to thee until death. So let's start with that opening line of the hymn. Faith of our fathers living still. And isn't that true? Some of you might say that maybe the memories of my father are not good, and there are things that still haunt me. There are things that God is still working out with me. But we also give thanks to God for the faith of the fathers of the Bible. We give thanks to God for the fathers of this church community who have been great role models and examples and inspiring people in our lives, as well as even our own fathers who have blessed us with a holy example. And those examples are still speaking into our hearts, even though that person may be now with the Lord, we still feel that, that sense of that witness is still alive and well, still living in us. Hebrews 11 speaks of the great heroes of the faith. And uh, just looking over this chapter, and I uh, did not read all of it, but just if you were to look over, you'd begin to see the names begin to lift off the pages. You would see the name of Noah, knowing that Noah was told by God that he was going to set the restart button, that the world was going to begin again. There was going to be a tremendous flood, and an ark needed to be built to save humanity. Noah, are you up for the task? But God, I don't know what an ark is. I don't know how to do this. I will instruct you. And so he was faithful and Noah was rewarded for his faithfulness. And then there is Abraham. Abraham, 80 years of age, right? Year, 80 years of age in his retirement, looking over his fields and in his retirement, enjoying the leisure of having great wealth and, a, and, uh, and yet still a sadness in his heart because Sarah was not able to give him a child. And yet God comes and says, Abraham, I'm calling you. I'm calling you to move from where you are, to start again, move to a place that I will show you, I'm going to give you a, a son, I'm going to give you a family, the descendants that you will bring will be great. And so we see that Abraham, even at age 80, begins to leave and do as God has called him. We continue to look through the pages and we see Moses who was entitled, Moses who had grown up in Pharaoh's household, and yet he chooses to identify himself with the Hebrews who were enslaved to the Pharaoh and to those people that were his people. And out of that burden, he finds himself called by God to go and stand before Pharaoh and plead for Pharaoh to let God's people go. He was faithful even though he said, I can't speak, I can't do this. God said, I will help you. I will give you what you need to do what I am asking you to do. So the, the names continue to lift off the pages. And as I read to you the scripture earlier, we found the name Gideon. And do you remember the story of Gideon? What kind of a military strategist would Gideon have been? He wanted to have great numbers to take on the armies that he was facing. And yet God said, Gideon, I got this. Send some of your soldiers home. What are you talking about? Send them home. And so he obeyed God. And then again, he said, have them drink from the water and I will tell you which ones to send home. Again, more of his army sent home. God, I don't understand. We have a great battle to fight. 
and yet Gideon is able to have a great victory because the Lord won the battle for him. And you continue to look down at Samson and other names that come off of the pages, and then you begin to get the references to the prophets Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who would not kneel down and worship the king and were thrown into the fiery furnace and yet God delivered them. They did not even smell of smoke, not a singe on their clothing or on their bodies and so they were delivered by God. Elijah and Elisha are made reference to by those widows whose children who were raised back to life from the dead. And so friends, I'm here to tell you, the Bible has is a great storybook of wonderful testimonies and witnesses for we to lean to lean into faith of the fathers faith of the fathers and mothers who've gone before us and their stories are recorded here and they inspire us and they speak into us now, when my daughter Rebecca was still a toddler, we were serving the church in Rockdale. We had a, a, a nursery set up and, and we had a rocking chair in the corner and it was our ritual every night when we put Rebecca to bed and we had done the same with Brian. We would uh, pull out the beginner's Bible. How many of you have a beginner's Bible? It's, a, it's just basically the Bible stories, the Bible characters, but it's told in simple story-like fashion with illustrations, pictures for the children to see. And we would read the Bible stories to Rebecca. And one night, it was such a funny moment as we were reading a story about the Sermon on the Mount. And she looked down and she saw a familiar head in the picture. See, it was Jesus and these heads surrounding him. And from the back, you could see a hairline that looked like my father's. And Rebecca looked and she pointed into the Bible and she said, Peepaw, Peepaw. Isn't that wonderful? In her imagination, the story was alive. And friends, that's how the Bible should be for us. These stories that still encourage us today. I mean, how many of us have felt like at a certain crossroad in our career or in our lives, we had to make a big decision? We were being called out to something that was unfamiliar than we were uh, used to, and we could rely and look back on the story of Abraham to speak an encouraging word to us about go, follow God's dream, follow God's vision, be obedient to what God has said to you. How many times have I sometimes felt in ministry, God, I don't understand. It seems like we don't have the resources we need and we're not getting what we need. And yet we realize like Gideon did, if we did it on our own strength, on our own merit, on our own wisdom, that it wouldn't be the battle of the Lord and it wouldn't be by the Lord's doing that we would accomplish the great things that get done. See friends, the Bible still speaks to us today. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is inspired by God. All all scripture is alive and useful for teaching and for correction. The Bible is alive. Faith of our fathers living still, whether it's in these scripture pages, whether it's sitting next to you on the pews beside you, whether it's your own earthly father, or if it's a great example, a wonderful witness today of someone who has been a mentor to you in the church, the, the faith of the fathers is alive and well and lives around us. The hymn continues, in spite of dungeons, fires, and sword. And the interesting thing about this is the background of this hymn. I don't know if you'll ever sing this hymn again once you learn the background of this hymn and its story behind who wrote it. Frederick, Frederick William Faber, who was an Anglican, who was trained as an Anglican priest, who converted back to Catholicism, okay, in the 1800s. This was 300 years after the Reformation. But he wrote this hymn to encourage Catholics in England who lived among many Protestants. And he was pointing them back to the time of Henry VIII. I don't know if you remember the story of Henry VIII, his first wife. He had a marriage and annulments, and he was trying to do political marriages. And then he also had a seemingly uh, interest in, in uh, the servants of his brides. And so he wanted to have his first marriage annulled, and the Pope was not very interested in doing that. And so what did he do? He started the Protestant Reformation in England. He started the Church of England because he didn't want to have to ask the Pope to annul his marriage. It's amazing history. It's not about necessarily a theological insight or something that lit a fire upon the beginning of the Church of England. It was over marriage and it was over uh, this idea of not asking the Pope for help. But the amazing part of that 
is that Henry VIII had six different wives throughout his life. And eventually he would come back to uh, Elizabeth uh, and she would be the reign. She would become Queen Elizabeth. But both Henry VIII and Elizabeth both made it their, uh, well, it was part of their government uh, way of establishing the church to torture and punish Roman Catholics. And so they were Catholics who harbored priests who honored the Pope were fined. They were scourged, they were seared with hot irons, and they were thrown into prison. And so friends, when you see these words, in spite of dungeons and fire and sword, you know that the faith of the fathers were those who pers were persecuted under the government who was trying to bring forth a new religion and make a separation from Catholicism. But I remind you today, no matter whether it's that broken history of part of the church or whether it's just the brokenness of our world today, there are martyrs today that are being killed across the world for their faith in Jesus Christ. There are those that are suffering, and that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to remind us of as well. Zechariah and Jeremiah were flogged and stoned. Isaiah was cut in two. The reference there is Isaiah, the prophet who was cut in two by King Manasseh. And all that is to remind you, friends, that some people received deliverance from lion's dens. Some people received deliverance from being thrown into a fiery furnace, but others gave the ultimate sacrifice of their lives, and they did not get their vindication on this side of the earth. And their witness still speaks to us today. I think of Jeremiah, and I think about his words in Jeremiah 31 about a new covenant, a new covenant that would come, that would be born in our hearts and our minds as God would write his word and his testimony on our very hearts. And I remember the words of the prophet Isaiah, who said there would be a child that would be born to us, a son that would be given, a suffering servant. When we had gone astray like sheep, he would forgive our iniquity, our iniquity would be laid upon him, and he would have the vision in Isaiah. 65 of a new heaven and a new earth, which is very closely tied to the, the idea of revelation and the God's bringing of one day the new kingdom and a new earth that God and Christ shall reign. In spite of dungeons, fires, and sword, God's people are faithful, even when life is not fair, even when life is not just. And then this third point, oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear the glorious word. When you think about your heart beating high with joy, what do you think of? I think of an inspired heart. I think of stories that uh, make, make my heart excited to be alive, that give me inspiration for continuing on in my work that I do for the Lord. And I tell you, I don't know when you've been recently inspired, but Mission Week inspires me every week, every year. I love seeing the servants of Marvin Church giving time, taking vacation time, uh, giving a hot day on a Saturday out in the sun, painting the side of the house, ripping out a floor and carpeting and putting in new substructure. I mean, th these Marvin people are working hard, whether they're in Pearl Hall and they're scraping off pill bottles or whether they're tying blankets or whether they're out on a work site. They're inspiring me, and I hope that you are seeing some of those inspiring stories. But to be honest with you, I was recently inspired with the anniversary of, of D-Day, 75 years. I don't know if you caught some of the documentaries that were on television. And I think about on that day, June 6, 1944, when I think about 4,414 4, Allied lives being uh, killed just in that one day on the invasion of Normandy beaches and the turning of the war and what was hoped to, to bring about a turn in World War II. And I remember as I was watching one of the documentaries about the 2nd Ranger Battalion, how inspired I felt about these young men, these, these rangers who were under the leadership of Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder. I'm waiting for a response from the Aggies. I get a silent, maybe a silent thumbs up for the mention of this Aggie into, into the church service. But uh, again, just an amazing story of the second Ranger Battalion who was commissioned with the job to go in to port a hole. And their role was to, to climb a hundred foot scale, a hundred foot cliff and to take out the six cannons that were on top of that cliff that both were uh, there and were a threat to those Utah and the uh, Omaha beaches below. 
Can you imagine that? They had missed their target. They were actually being shot upon as they arrived at the place at the bottom of the cliff. And this uh, documentary I saw was uh, one of the soldiers who was a survivor talked about as one man fell, the next man would begin to climb up those ladders as Germans shot down and as Germans dropped grenades on them. Amazing. But these men, I was so enamored by the fact that these men were so focused on one mission. Their mission was to get up, to climb up and to scale that cliff and to take out those guns no matter the cost, knew that it was a very important part of the mission and the success of the D-Day invasion. Oh, what courage. Oh, what strength and fortitude. Oh, the willingness to lay down one's life when one falls for the next to begin to climb up that ladder and to, and to give their very all for freedom's cause. And I thought about that story and my inspiration of 225 men of which only 90 would survive the mission on Portaho. And I thought about in the church today, could we be so focused on one mission Could we be so focused on reaching the lost in our community for Jesus Christ that we would be willing to to climb and to do what's necessary, to make the sacrifices necessary to, to make an impact for our community for Jesus Christ? And as we think about the City Fest coming up with the Palau Ministry in October and all the trainings that will be a part of that and all of the the meetings that will take place and the prayer and all the ways we will try to get us ready to be invitational, knowing that the most important thing that we can do is to bring somebody to the square on both of those days who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may hear the gospel and that maybe would be invited back by you to our church to be nurtured in the faith. Do we have that kind of focus? Do we have that kind of sacrificial uh, desire to see God's kingdom be advanced, to push back the darkness in the community that we live and so that more may know the love of Jesus Christ? Oh, how our hearts beat with high joy when we think of the possibilities of what could happen in October in our community with over 300 churches, over 300 churches rallying together and bringing those who do not yet know Christ or who have walked away from the church to come back into the fold in faith with in relationship with Jesus Christ. Faith of our fathers, holy faith. And I began this sermon, friends, with chapter 11, verse one. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. And I looked at a word study. Faith is confidence. And in the Greek, it's hupo, hupo histemi. Together, hupo histesis. But it basically means under hupo histemi to make a stand. And it's this idea that what holds underneath a column or a stand that must be erect and sturdy, that foundation. Faith is that foundation that sits at the bottom of a column that holds up a great cathedral like this, that holds up a great structure, and faith matters. And so I say to our dads and our granddads and everyone in the congregation today who has an influence on any person in this community, faith matters. Your faith matters. What you show to your children and your grandchildren matters. And the faithfulness you have in your attendance matters. And when you open the Bible and you read it, it matters. And when you pray for your children in your community, it matters because faith matters. Faith of our fathers is a holy faith. Holy meaning it's set apart. It is that sense of God's commitment with us. And so I want to share you one last story because sometimes dads, we don't always get it right. Sometimes there are seasons in our lives where we find ourselves estranged from our kids. Or maybe we feel like as we sit here today, we didn't raise our kids as we'd hoped. We didn't give them the influence of Christ as we'd hoped for. And let me just remind you, as I heard a story on the radio this week by a man by the name of David Jeffers, a veteran whose father was an alcoholic who abandoned his family, leaving David with a huge hole in his heart and an estrangement that took many, many years to repair. And he went off to war and he came back and he married a woman, but his own personal life crisis came when that divorce came and he found his marriage ended. But a person invited him to church. 
Someone invited him to come and to attend church with them. And as they attended church together, he found the love of Christ in the community. And he began to hear the gospel and the love of Jesus was being shared and the teachings of what it meant to follow Christ. And he gave his heart to the Lord and his life was changed. All that is to remind us is that it doesn't matter if you have missed uh, out on a great heavenly, a great father, maybe earthly father who has raised you up. The church is always still here and available to, to fill that in and to, to bring love, support, and prayer and encouragement. And that's what David experienced. And he felt so called after his conversion to reconnect with his father. He felt that God put it upon his heart that he should reconnect with his father. He reached out to him. They began to build a relationship and ultimately he shared faith with his own father and the son led his father to Christ. What a powerful testimony that is. The power of God at work amongst us and the faith of the fathers, the greater fathers of the church who loved David when he felt like his life had fallen apart. The great fathers of the scripture who inspired him as he learned the stories of the faith that he did not know growing up. Friends, faith of our fathers, holy faith. We will be true to thee till death. The scripture ends with these words. These were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. What was that something better? Actually, that something better is a someone better. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the one with whom we put our confidence. He is our sure foundation. Jesus Christ is the one who's worthy of the death of the martyrs who died for the faith Jesus is the one who the prophets foretold, and Jesus is the one that we build our lives upon. He is the one in whom our fathers put their faith. He is the one that we entrust in faith to the children who come behind us. Faith of our fathers, holy faith. We will be true to thee till death. Thank you for watching our broadcast this morning. As I wish for you God's blessings, I want to personally invite you to join us for Sunday morning services and fellowship on our campus at 300 West Irwin Street, downtown Tyler. I hope that you will visit our website to learn more about our church and its ministry and serving opportunities. May God bless you and may Christ be formed in you.